And let me then move on to September 55, from where Benedict left to something similar. September 55 is an important date, which leads to, which, well, it's actually a VR experience that tells about what the uh, Istanbul Namazans have gone through on the 6th and 7th of uh, October of the same year. And it makes the audience feel like they are present in uh, in a photography studio uh, back at that time, and they watch everything from the eyes of the photographer. First, the audience takes pictures of people who come in. They listen to what they talk. And then, slowly, the, the, a crowd gathers outside on the streets. The audience sees this, and the VR ends before the incidents, the violent incidents start. On the 6th and 7th of October, 5,000 buildings were looted, 11 people were killed, and the minorities were forced, uh, September, they were forced to leave. Now, I'd like to show you the fragment uh, just for a very short while so that you can gain an impression. Çağrı Hakan Zaman and Nil Tuzcu have collaborated with me. They're both architects. Çağrı Hakan Zaman is at the same time someone who is very actively engaged in AI, and Nil Tuzcu is an urban planner. This, uh, she's, uh, she's the one who's behind most of the research that goes into VR. So what we, what did we do? Well, basically, we used it as a tool to remember and to reflect. In a way, we don't go beyond that because this prompter is enough. 
how do we create this environment? Let me first dwell on that. When creating the uh, context, we used archives. And although we used archives, we should not forget it's a fictional environment. This physically has not uh, happened, but we've tried to recreate uh, September 55 as best as we can. We used uh, the 1956 um, judge who actually carried out the proceedings, his archives, and uh, we also made use of uh, Maryam Shahinyan and Ozeb Milenyan's pictures uh, from a collection. It's those pictures that we use to create this photography studio. For instance, on the left, you see Maryam Shahinyan's picture and also her mirror. Well, at least a one to one reproduction of what existed in her studio. And here, you see the tiles. We try to reproduce it as best as we can, making use of some of the real references we had. Furthermore, we also thought what else could have existed. Perhaps the milliard daily of the day, a kiss journal, which was quite popular at that time. Taksim. Um, nightclub, which was very popular, and its brochure, and also a calendar, a wall calendar. Most probably, that wouldn't have been in that studio photography, but we did want to pin down the audience to the day and to the time of the event with this wall calendar. And on different parts of the studio, we place these objects. In a way, archival documents gain space. They gain a spatial dimension, and they become visible in the context of 1955. In a way, we, by going back to the movies of 1955, we decorated the photography like a, a radio, like a complicated phone. We looked at other houses to redecorate our own photography studio. And here? This is the Taksim nightclub uh, brochure, the radio, the lace, uh, white lace uh, blanket that went with the radio. Well, actually, we use what is prepared for an Xbox, a three-dimensional recorder. And uh, on the left, you can see that we actually just capture the size of people and their movements rather than their features and faces. In that sense, we decided to go back to the past with the faces and the postures, uh, because that shows the uncoverable uh, distance between now and uh, the past. And I'll tell you how the software works. It's a three-dimensional and a volumetric recording. So when you go left and right or when you go around, you can see it from different angles. I have a question, Dennis. When you were doing the shooting, so you just recorded the movements and you added the space or the context by modeling it. Yeah. Of course, all the context, the space was modeled. But how did you decide what to choose? An art, because you could have used it to recreate a, a physical uh, uh, space instead of a VR. On the other hand, VR is not completely costless either. So what? how do you decide which one to use? Well, using a real space. Yeah, I mean shooting in a real physical space. Well, in VR, if you want to create an immersion experience where you can walk, we don't have a, a 360 uh, um, technology to do it. We have to model it so that you can walk inside a space. So you shoot, and then you combine it with uh, a model. You can't do that. You have to model first. Is that my understanding? Well, as Benedict showed, the last goodbye showed you that they modeled 
actually Auschwitz, and the person is standing in front of a green screen. Uh, technically, it's similar, more or less similar to what we do. This was physically in Auschwitz, but in a green screen in Auschwitz. I think they did that for ethical reasons. They wanted a real experience. They didn't want to fake Pincus in a studio from a journalistic perspective. Mm -hmm. Right, and a few more technical details. We did 3D, we used 3D Studio Max, we used Kinec, and uh, we wanted this presence, a walk in uh, possibility, which uh, can only be done with Unreal Engine and Unity. We used Unreal Engine for our purposes. Actually, it's a video game. Uh, it has a video game logic. And we used HTC Vive, a goggle which has two sensors, which allows you, which allows the uh, gear to track where you stand in the environment, in the context. Now, why VR and what does it add to uh, what we're trying to do? And please interrupt me any time with your questions. First of all, we wanted it makes the narrative spatial. It makes it subjective. It makes it individual and ordinary. Spending time in that uh, environment is important for you to get bored, for you to have time to look around so that you feel the immersion. And being in a space also has another impact. I think it creates a memory. What I'm trying to say is, from my own experience, of course, uh, here's what happens to me. Nondole Peña, what I showed you a moment ago, had a Greenland uh, film on the ice uh, that melts. You go to the ice, you can walk there, you have a sense of depth, you can look left, you can look right. And once you have that experience, three, four months later, while I was watching TV, I saw the exact same iceberg. And I said, I've been there. But how was I there? I can't have been there. I've never been to Greenland. And five minutes later, I figured out it was a VR that I had experienced this iceberg. So there is this aspect of the brain being hacked, perhaps, by this experience. And on the one hand, in 2016, you gain a memory of 1955, not a physical, not a real memory, but certainly a memory of 55. One other aspect is this is not all about the past. It gives you an idea this is also about the present. In fact, the discussions you listen to, the conversations you listen to, the conversations you hear of people being photographed in that studio are so ordinary. You could believe they could be spontaneous dialogues with you and your friend. And this is precisely to make sure that we connect to today, although uh, we feel it's in 1955 these conversations are taking place. It connects us to the present that we're here. And how and why did we use VR? VR is a new medium, and that is why it has a lot of limitations. When you try to do everything, you end up doing nothing. And that is why these limitations and constraints need to be worked with. In fact, they need to be used creatively. That's what we try to do when we shot. VR, most probably, its best offering is this first-person experience. When you put on the goggles and when you walk, you gain a new subjective presence. You feel yourself like a photographer in a photography studio witnessing a looting and you feel you are one of the minority, that the, all the rest of the crowd outside is against you. So that's, that was an important choice on our part. Furthermore, the fact that we stop right before violence starts 
was an important uh, choice because in VR, the feeling of presence is extremely important. However, recreating violence is not possible. Uh, you could blast a bomb like in Project Syria or use sounds to create effects like uh, throw fragments of uh, glasses on other people, but you cannot really recreate being subject to violence. It, you have to be present and it's very difficult to recreate VR because nobody can really physically assault you through VR. So that's why we decided to stop at that point. My question is about the ethics of VR. Should we go into that? Maybe in a in a moment, if if it's okay for you. And uh, what else? In September '55, being in this photography studio, being stuck, being all alone, is an important feeling. VR allows for that because when you put on those glasses you're actually stuck in those glasses it's sort of claustrophobic and so we've used that to advance our uh, idea of extending it to the whole presence to the whole context and then Exhibiting it is important. We don't want it to remain inside the VR. We want the discussion, the reflection to continue beyond the VR experience. And here's how we exhibited the piece. Inside the VR experience, Maryam Shahinyan and Seth Nelson have pictures that you see. You can look at these pictures at length. But when you take off your glasses, we allowed the audiences to see the pogrom pictures of the post-7 September period. And all of a sudden, the studio transforms itself into the post-pogrom stage. In a sense, the VR and the physical world are connected. The past and the present, in a way, are reconnected. At least that's what we attempted to do. In Istanbul, while we were exhibiting the piece, we uh, had the architectural layout drawn out so that anyone uh, as an external outsider could understand what kind of a context we were talking about. We put furniture, we put glass fragments. And in a way, we created a space to remember the past. And to why remember the past? Because we need to remember the past so that we can move beyond the same limitations and move forward. In fact, we had a, a book where audience could reflect on their experiences. It said, I think we have to understand to be really present. 